I'm going to argue for the, the tremendous importance of disequilibrium, that is being away from thermodynamic equilibrium, as an enabler not only of uh, the self-organization, which is a sort of famous idea dating back over 100 years uh, to Darwin and Spencer, but also as a thing that brings about classicality uh, and uh, even a stable memory. All of the good things that make things life interesting depend on thermo thermodynamic disequilibrium. And that uh, I'm going to talk about the, the subject of today, that is, uh, what does it mean for something to happen for an event? And I'm going to argue that there is no event that is set in stone, uh, that anything that can happen will, it can unhappen and, and will do when a system equilibrates. Uh, this gives rise to the Boltzmann brain problem I'll talk about, which means that we need to, I think we need to, although I'm not a cosmologist, I think we need to look for, for non-equilibrating cosmologies in order to get away from the Boltzmann brain problem, which is a, it, it really subverts the uh, entire scientific method by saying that, that what you observe is not a, a good grounds for imagining what's out there in the universe just beyond your reach. Uh, so now we're going to go, I'm going to go on to the, to the, uh, to explain how, how uh, a disequilibrium enables classicality. Uh, so this is the, the story of uh, uh, quantum Darwinism. It's called quantum Darwinism by, by uh, Zurich. Uh, but, uh, but I think a better name for it would be quantum spam because you get a lot of copies that are all come from the same original and they're not descended from each other. And so the way it works is that you have a system and it, this classicality comes about because the system interacts with its environment. But the, the environment and the interaction are of a special sort. You need interactions that are commuting and you need the parts of the environment not to interact much with each other. The result of this is an entangled state in which there is a correlation of the system with each of the sub-environments in one basis, which obfuscates their correlation in other bases. And you can, Jess Riedel will talk about that later, and you can look at these papers. Uh, so the typical situations where this happens when the environment is not at equilibrium, and as I say, contains subsystems that interact weakly. And the Earth's environment is like that. So uh, uh, we, the, the uh, main example of this, or the most uh, uh, highly, highly uh, thought of example, is the photons that are making redundant copies of, of everybody in the room in a position basis. And some of them, if at least we have an open window, are escaping, and they're never going to interact with anything else again. So we have redundant copying in the position basis. So uh, Jess and I thought of a kind of scenario that might be possible to analyze for how uh, disequilibrium enables the emergence of classicality and then as your system comes to equilibrium the classicality disappears. So we imagine taking a box and a dust drain and we put it in a, in a perhaps a superposition of places in the box but now we put in a, a thermal photon bath that's at a different temperature from the dust drain and for a while the photons bounce off the dust drain and make redundant copies of it. But then the photons get reabsorbed by the dust drain repeatedly, and the thing though goes to a thermal state, which has lost its classicality. So the moral of this is whatever happens, like the dust grain being in this place, can and in general will unhappen when the system goes back to equilibrium. So let's talk about self-organization now. This is a idea that uh, this 150 year old idea uh, that is that dissipation promotes self-organization. If you didn't have the light bulb, uh, the fluctuation into the fish and so on would be very, very much less likely. Uh, but it's easier to think about these processes in, the, in a, a much simpler model that's just a, a, a discrete dynamics, totally classical. This is my favorite uh, uh, cellular automaton. The rule for it is, is this. Uh, it, the uh, the uh, future of any site is determined by its past and the t first and second neighbors on either side. It's, 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 it's a Ising model, essentially a deterministic Ising model 
with the equal strength interaction to the first and second neighbors. So uh, uh, this, of course, gives the reversible dynamics. And if you start it with a simple initial condition that's periodic except for a little defect, it produces this deterministic thing that gets more and more complicated. So uh, this is subjectively complicated, but how can, in what sense, uh, rigorous sense, can we say it's, it's more complicated? Well, this is the idea of algorithmic information theory, and it is the, uh, the application of the computer to Occam's razor. So in the Occam's razor uh, uh, principle, we will take a phenomenon and we are supposed to attribute it to, of, of all of the hypotheses that explain it, to the one that is the most economical in its assumptions. But how do you measure that economy, uh, scientists? In fact, the main use of Occam's razor by science, practicing scientists is to argue that their own assumptions are simpler than other assumptions. Uh, but you can, in principle, you can get out of this problem by, by putting, uh, using a computer. So the alternative hypotheses become bit strings. The uh, computational path, the, the, the deductive path becomes a universal computer and you just compare the lengths of programs to produce this output and say the shortest one is the most plausible. Well, I'm not going to talk about the size of the shortest program. We're going to talk about the running time of it. So if you believe this shortest program is most plausible, you also have to take with that the execution path. So it may take a lot of execution, just as it may take a lot of calculation to infer the spectrum of, of uh, a molecule from Schrodinger's equation. Uh, so this is an idea I've been advocating for several decades. Logical depth, the plausible amount of computational work required to create the object. Of course, it's, it's only semi-computable, so that's a problem in, in using it in practice. But in, in theory, it's a good idea. Uh, so let's go back to this cellular automaton and think about it in terms of logical depth. Well, this is a simple, simply describable initial state. could be described by a short program a fast executing program. And then a state like this looks kind of random or, or, or disorderly, but in fact it can be described by giving the description of this initial state and then saying how long you have to run it. And indeed, even a, a reasonable sized chunk of this thing contains a plausible evidence for this whole evolution. So we say a structure is logically deep if it contains internal evidence of a long computation uh, required to make it from a, a small description. But let's say we re let this thing run for a very long time, exponential in the, in the number of, of sites in the cellular automaton. Then we get a messy situation like this. And you can say this thing is very old, but it doesn't have evidence for a long history. And why does it, in, in, in this, it obviously looks kind of not very complicated, uh, very random. But in what rigorous sense does it not have evidence for a long history? The reason is that if you describe this thing's true history, you would have to say, from that simple initial condition, how long would you have to run it? And how long would you have to run it would be a number of approximately the logarithm of an exponential, that is, the about as many bits as, as the size of the configuration itself. So the the actual history of this thing in terms of its plausibility would be short-circuited by a simple description which says, just print this out. Uh, so uh, this is just what I said. To specify the state by this actual history, you'd have to say the exact number of steps to run it. And this is very large. And the, the uh, plausibility in terms of Occam's razor of this is not uh, much ahead of that of just print it out. So in our world, it's full of things that have internal evidence of a complicated history. A world that comes to equilibrium, typically uh, long-range correlations disappear, or they are reduced to a very small amount of information described by some order parameter. And in, in a world at thermal equilibrium, you'll typically get only correlations mediated by the present. Uh, for example, uh, in the world of thermal equilibrium, if you specify the state here, it contains almost no information about the state of some place far away, although it may have a lot of correlation with the state of some part of the system right next to it. Uh, so on the other hand, in, in a world out of equilibrium, we have uh, correlations that are 
generically long long range with a lot of uh, a number of bits of correlation of mutual information, and it doesn't come from con contiguity, but from a V-shaped path in space time. So, for example, I got a couple of coins. Uh, one of them is from from this country, and another one is from the island of Grenada, where my daughter-in-law comes from, uh, and they have square money there. It was a, a, a former British colony, part of the Commonwealth, and so it has a picture of Queen Elizabeth II on it. Now, these two coins uh, have never been in contact, except when I put them in my back pocket together. And, uh, but the reason they both have pictures of the same person on doesn't have actually anything to do with Queen Elizabeth II. It has to do with Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, OK, so this is a typical feature of, of our world. Uh, so let's go back to something that's a little bit more realistic, such as a, a picture of our world. So uh, this cellular automaton was a toy model, but real systems behave similarly. They lose their complexity, their long-range correlation, and, and even their classicality when they approach equilibrium. So let's take our world here, and we put it in a perfectly reflective box. Uh, and then we just let it stew in its own juice for a while. Uh, I'm ignoring the uh, source of heat from internal radioactivity. Say, uh, we're cutting it off from the sun and just letting it bathe in its own thermal radiation. And after a while, uh, the, the uh, visible features of the Earth will look, look like that. If you went and stuck your head in there, you wouldn't see anything. You'd just see the thermal uh, glow. And the thing would have, not, would have, as I argue here, even have lost its classicality. So as I said, if a system is allowed to run for a long time comparable to the recurrence time, you cannot infer its actual history from its present state. But conversely, a, a deep structure, one that seems to have had a long history, might be the accidental result of a thermal fluctuation. This is what's called a Boltzmann brain. How many here people have heard of Boltzmann brains? OK, how many people here are Boltzmann brains? <laughs> <laughs> You're wrong. I'm the only one. OK, so uh, this is, this is uh, 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 from an article by Sean Carroll that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it, I think it came out in the New York Times. Uh, and this explains uh, what, I, what I call the diabolical conundrum. Boltzmann fluctuation is, could explain the low entropy state of the world as a result of selection, anthropic selection, but they undermine the scientific method by implying that our picture of the universe, which is based on uh, logic and, and observation, is false. And the reason is here. So what we say is, well, there was some big fluctuation that made a non-equilibrium universe and gradually relaxing down from it in either direction of time, we get increasing entropy. But wait a minute. We say, we don't know about this past. We know only about today. And what's the most likely way today could have come about? Well, that is not it's a big fluctuation that made the Big Bang long ago, but something that just made something much smaller, like the solar system or maybe just my head. So our, our scientific method t tells us how we make inferences about elsewhere and other times is pretty severely disabled. Uh, and now people began worrying about equilibration in the 19th century, even when they called it heat death. But it's already a problem, uh, not in the far future, but in the present, because the inhabitants of any universe that will ultimately equilibrate have to worry about whether they are real or not. In other words, they must make an additional postulate, which is not supported by observation, that they are atypically early in its evolution. Now, uh, some of the people who are going to talk here, uh, Sean Carroll and some of his co-authors, proposed to escape from this Boltzmann brain problem, which is a problem for our current model of the universe, which says we're going to go to a desitter state at positive temperature. I think it was 10 to the minus 30 degrees Kelvin or something like that. Uh, but it's going to go on forever. So most likely, all of us aren't real. We're just fluctuations in an old, dead universe. <clears throat> and they say, no, we'd, a classical system would have this problem, but quantum systems don't have it because there's no measuring apparatus to record uh, the fluctuation. And I, I had a disagreement with the, these people. Are a friendly, uh, lengthy discussion at, earlier this year at Caltech with, with, uh, with Pollock. Uh, now, the reason I don't agree with that idea is an, a, a scenario that Jess Riedel suggested as to why you should have Boltzmann brains 
in any thermal state, whether it's classical or quantum, even if there's no observer to observe them. So I'm arguing that tree falls even if nobody's there to see it. And the idea is, let's say this pi sub BB is a projector onto a state of the solar system, say. Uh, and we're going to paste it into some pretty empty space out of the vacuum. Uh, and then we say that any finite temperature thermal state can be represented as a convex combination of a little bit of Boltzmann brain and a whole lot of depleted thermal state. Now let's say we have some guy who is an all-powerful preparator, and he tosses this lambda bias coin, and he makes either the Boltzmann brain, or in this case the whole solar system, or a depleted thermal state, and then just to be sure that what he's done, he takes a takes a picture of the inhabitants of the Earth waving goodbye as he disconnects himself from the system. And then he says, well, most of the time I just made a kind of depleted thermal state, kind of a negative image of the, of the, of the solar system. But occasionally I made exactly a solar system. So uh, since this is a valid preparation of the thermal state, uh, and keeping in mind that it's in principle impossible to distinguish di different preparations of the same, same mixed state, it's hard to see why the inhabitants of this de Sitter patch don't have some probability of experiencing uh, this illusion of being a, a, a solar system. Now, uh, uh, Jason's reply to this was to say that the, uh, the absence of de Sitter fluctuations doesn't apply to all thermal states, but only those where you, where you postulate that they are purified by a reference system of a particular form. And so trying to cram that idea, which I still don't like, into my, uh, uh, my worldview, I say that, that, that uh, these authors are using an Occam razor type argument, but they're arguing for simplicity not of the system, but of the system and a particular purification, which is they say, we don't have any reason for believing that the universe is described by something more complicated than the, uh, than the uh, a pure state of that form. So, uh, so my new or adjusted my new, new criterion for saying whether a state has a, a certain probability is to say, can in a mixed state, is 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 a pure state in its support, and if it is, it has a possibility of being that. It's a more uh, stringent condition than saying that if you measured it, you would get some probability of that getting state. For example, a Lorentz vacuum has no probability of being a Boltzmann brain, but a, a, a positive temperature thermal state like a de Sitter state does. So I think this is, oh, I'm going to say one more thing. Uh, Boltzmann brain arises from the doomsday argument applied to temporal typicality. It's, just, it's a dangerous argument. But I believe they can be used with some validity, if you're careful, to argue that simple life is likely, but complex life is relatively unlikely. Uh, however, we have to worry about the more severe doomsday argument for civilization, which is only a few millionths of the time old that it could potentially survive. Uh, thank you. <laughs>